So she's going to do a dance. While yeah, I'm going to do an interpretive <laughs> dance. While I go. No, not. All right. So um, for those of you that got here a little late, just to get uh, into perspective of what I'm reading from, know that it comes. It's being narrated from somebody who's not born yet, or but they have just at this moment in the section I'm going to read been conceived. So this is um, one week after conception which is referred to as an anchored soul, as opposed to a floating soul. And uh, I guess what you need to know also, let's see, I made a couple notes. Um, the parents, Nina and Rick, are do not know they're pregnant. And not only that, do they not know they're pregnant, they don't know that, uh, I mean, they're staying at a, a friend's house and don't have a place of their own, aren't even really in a committed relationship for it. So that's where we are. Whoops, okay. So, it's been one week that I've been an anchored soul, and I wish I could be more excited about it. I was so sure I was going to be a boy, and now that I'm not, I'm all confused. I still feel like a boy, and consider myself a boy, but my cells are definitely going girl. As for my biological headquarters, what I've started calling this blob of multiplying cells, it's not the real me. It's just the body I've been assigned for my, um, my mission. I mean, there must be a reason the known gave me a boy's soul and a girl's body. Maybe I'm supposed to be an undercover agent. All the boys will secretly know I'm one of them, but the girls will think I'm one of them. I'll be like a spy. Or, or maybe I'm going to be like some kind of shaman. Neither boy nor girl, but mostly boy. That would be cool, too. I'd be all holy. <laughs> Another thought that crossed my mind, this one a bit less welcome, but gaining credibility by the second is that the known didn't give me a boy's soul. I was just so jazzed to be hanging out with Rick and Howie that I made the choice myself and attributed it to the known. Maybe we souls don't come in a sex. Maybe we're like the known, a swirling tangle of learning and possibility. Only the closer we get to the land of forgetting, the more we get attached to its countless limitations. If that's the case, the boy-girl thing isn't quite as black and white as everyone in the land of forgetting seems to think. Could this be one of the things they've forgotten, that I've forgotten? One thing's for certain. Rick and Nina are going to need special skills to raise me. Babies are highly impressionable. Parents' opinions, assumptions, and needs can either make a child's life bliss or a living hell. None of this changes the fact that I still wish I were a boy. But what are the ingredients of a boy? What am I going to miss out on? I know what they think in the land of forgetting. Boys like to climb things, boys like adventure, boys like slugs and snails and puppy dogs' tails. But are these exclusively boy traits? And what, pray tell, are the ingredients of a girl? Sugar, spice, nice? From what I've seen, there's a whole lot more to it than that. Luckily, I can still travel into other people's thoughts and to other places so I can research. Even if I will forget everything once I get born, surely there's some advantage to enlightenment. Now, if Nina and Rick would just figure out I'm here. Planned Parenthood. The name alone fills me with confidence. <laughs> and it's so fortuitous that my own grandmother-to-be, Iris, should work at this place with the thoughtful moniker. I drop into the small, overly lit waiting room with its three worn couches and racks of magazines and find it full of women. Odd, where are the men? Don't they need to be in on the planning, too? The next thing I notice is that not all the women look happy, which is also odd. A quick scan of their thoughts provides shocking information. Some of these women don't want their babies. Either they're too young, or they don't have enough money, or enough time, or the patience. For that matter, some of the anchored souls are having second thoughts, too. The potential mom of one anchored soul hates the guy who forced the sperm on her. She hates him. Every time she thinks about that little blob of cells growing inside her, all she can feel is hate. And this other anchored soul chose parents who came together for only that one night. They didn't even know each other's names. And they were drunk and way young. And the potential grandmother is going to be a total nightmare. She keeps, keeps saying things to her daughter like, let this be a lesson to you, and if you just be more like your sister. The yearn sure causes us to make some stupid choices. I notice another anchored soul in the corner. He's chosen a perfectly nice mother, ready for a baby, but is so petrified by the sheer unpredictability of life, by the crazy gamble we each take as we try to worm our way into breathing, 
that he's planning to bail. Even though he totally loves his mom and dad, he's fixated on all the things that could go wrong. Don't do it, I scream, hoping he'll tune into my thoughts and hear me. But he's so obsessed by the possibility of his umbilical cord wrapping around his neck and depriving him of oxygen that he doesn't hear me. These sad scenarios make my gender worries seem so trivial. How could an anchored soul be so scared he'd choose to evaporate himself? He's, he's so close. Or I thought he was close until I was hit with this whole new thing to worry about. What if I attach to parents who don't want me? What if they decide not to have me? Yikes. When I foisted myself into Nina and Rick's lives, I was so desperate for life, it didn't occur to me to take their needs into consideration. Duh. So I'm back to square one, wishing, hoping, praying for luck. Ugh. The odds for a soul getting born are about the same as the odds for a hopeful seed blowing in the wind. Will it land on soil or cement? And if it's lucky enough to hit soil, will it rain in time? Will there be sun? Will it miss being chomped down by some hungry sparrow or caught in the grooves of some traveler's muddy boot? But I don't want to be a burden who screws up my parents' lives, who causes them to say things like, if only I hadn't had you. I want to be cherished, adored. I want photo albums full of my pictures, a room full of colorful mobiles. We need to be a team. We all need to want me. So if Nina and Rick decide to want me, I'll go for it. But if they don't, I'm out of here. I'll evaporate myself just like that. Poof! Right back into the coziness of the known. Could be worse. I could get born only to be left in a dumpster. I decide not to stick around and visit with Iris. I need to find Nina and Rick now. I locate Nina right where she was when I last saw her, lying on the couch in the living room with a cool wash rag on her head, her feet propped on Rick's lap, thinking she has a stomach flu. Not exactly the secure, loving embrace I was hoping for. At least she and Rick have started looking for a place of their own. I wish I could say it's because they're completely in love and ready to have a baby, but that wouldn't be accurate. Pablo's back from his mom. Pablo, back from his mom's, is making it pretty clear that he wants them to move out. At the moment, he's in the kitchen making a racket as he cooks himself dinner. He's had a bad day at the flower store where he works. It's the 4th of July, and besides never wanting to see another red, white, or blue carnation as long as he lives, he's sick of people, especially Rick and Nina. Rick whispers to Nina, when did Dink say she'd get back? They're waiting for Dink to get back with some pot, which Nina thinks will help calm her stomach. Soon, I hope. Rick looks over his shoulder to the kitchen. He hates feeling beholden to Pablo. We've got to get our own place. A cabinet door slams in the kitchen. Rick massages her socked foot. You doing okay? Not too bad, today. At least I was able to get a little food down around lunch. Being mistaken for a stomach flu isn't doing my self-esteem a world of good, but I'm trying to approach it with a sense of humor. <laughs>